It wasn't a case of him saying, I want to mentor you. It was a case of him saying, hey, let's study a score together. And, and, and I think that that's an approach that, uh, that uh, was attractive to me and I think attractive probably to a lot of younger teachers. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer and educator, and each week I have the great fortune to speak with and share the stories and wisdom of musicians and leaders in the band community. The Everything Band podcast is a proud member of the Music Teachers Development Podcast Network. The Muted Network provides support in the form of audio on-demand programming designed by and for music educators. You can find more information about our network at mutedpodcasts.com. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I really appreciate your time and hope that you are finding value from these interviews. I rely on word of mouth and social media to bring the show to new listeners. If you think you know one or two people who might find these interviews useful, please let them know about it. You can also help by following me and sharing posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Remember, help your students live up to the best that is in them through music. And now, on to my next guest, Bruce Pearson. Hi, Bruce. Hi, Mark. I'm glad to be on your program. Thank you. I'm delighted you would join me. You're someone who I've always wanted to have on the show. You mean so much to the music education community. Thank you. So, Bruce, can you start for those who may not know who you are, and there are probably are a couple, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Um, like uh, Mark is alluding to, my name is Bruce Pearson, and uh, I've been involved in uh, teaching at all levels from people as young as fourth graders all the way up through university and also graduate school uh, courses. And um, starting in about 1980, I started writing uh, professionally. I had overlapping uh, teaching and writing careers. And the first publication that I wrote was um, of, uh, I mean, there I had written some arrangements, but the first publication uh, that probably I became known for was a method book called uh, Best in Class that came to print in 1982. And uh, then along the line, um, I was teaching elementary uh, school band and uh, had a dual job where I was also the music supervisor. So I had uh, uh, the responsibility of organizing curriculum, both for choral as well as instrumental. And I kept wondering why in the world can't we in instrumental music have the same kind of wonderful, oh, extended musical experiences that they have in classroom music. And thus came about Standard of Excellence, which came to, to print in 1993. And uh, Standard of Excellence uh, is still doing really, really uh, well and, and um, used by you know lots and lots of band directors around the world. Um, Having said around the world, Standard of Excellence has been uh, published in, well, first of all, Best in Class was published in German in addition to English. Um, Best in Class was also published in Japanese, too. But when I come to Standard of Excellence, it's now been published in, in uh, Chinese. It's now in Italian, as well as um, I've been an, able to teach at most of the uh, English-speaking uh, countries. Um, then as I listened to band directors around the world, um, I've, some of them were saying, you know, I, I'm tired of playing whatever tune it was in Standard of Excellence, but I love the pedagogy. And if I play that one, that tune one more time, I'm going to die. <laughs> so would you please write another method book? And so thus came about um, the tradition of excellence. And I was honored to be able to uh, co-author that and with a, a dear, dear friend. And now he's gone on to become the associate director of the president's own United States Marine Band. And his name is, of course, Ryan Nowlin. So um, in addition to that, uh, I continue to write and clinic and uh, teach uh, throughout uh, the country, in fact, throughout the world. Yeah, that's, tr that's tremendous. Uh, the school I'm teaching at I'm looking at method books and I'm, I'm it's a near run thing standard of excellence and another one I won't tell you which one are <laughs> the two I'm deciding <laughs> on you know I think I think it's really important uh, as you say you know you're considering other books 
And one of the things I think is really important is that uh, there's so many things one needs to examine when you do a, a method book. First of all, it has to fit you. It has to fit your teaching style, your teaching philosophy. Some books emphasize tone. Some books emphasize rhythm. Some books say, I don't want my kids to uh, have to linger too long on these basics. I want to get them playing and thus the pacing maybe is a little faster. And uh, some people say, no, I want to, I want to make sure they get the basics before they go on. So when a person selects a method book, there's just tons of things to consider. And um, I can direct people to uh, my colleague, Ryan Nolan and I have written a book. It's really become a resource book used by many colleges and universities. And that's called Teaching Bandwidth Excellence. And in there, I list the, I think it's 10 or 12 things that one must consider as you are looking for a method book. No question. I spent nearly 50 or 16 years teaching music theory, and, and that was the same thing. You know, I when you look at any textbook or any method book or anything like that, it's it's really a resource, and it has to match up with your philosophies and how you want to go about it. Yes. And it's it, so personal. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm at that, that point of the process now where I've got it down to two. I think when you line up the... Um, the pedagogy of standard of excellence with the pedagogy of tradition of excellence, you'll find that they're very, very similar. Pacing is, is similar. Sequencing is similar. So um, uh, if you, if, if they like a standard of excellence, but want to try something different, of course uh, you might want to look at a tradition of excellence. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Cause my, my, the kids that um, I have here, they love Sawmill Creek as a tune. Sawmill Creek. Interesting. That was, a uh, if there's a recreation of a oh I'll I'll call it must have been about 17, 18th or uh, late 19th century little uh, old kind of an amusement or should we say a tourist attraction and wouldn't you know it's called Sawmill Creek now um, I want you to know they don't get any royalties off of that though yeah that 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 tune is um, ubiquitous with every song that you mention. I can I can actually go back and know exactly where I was uh, when I when I wrote that, and that was in a hotel room and uh, someplace in Kansas. Oh wow! I wrote that tune. <laughs> yeah, my fifth graders right now are playing your Starfire March out of your best performance book. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another good tune. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Bruce, can you tell me about your musical background? How did you get into music as a child? When did you start and what instrument do you play? Well, first of all, I grew up in, in a rather athletic family. My uncle was the athletic director at a university. So I, uh, I was very, very involved in athletics and uh, I played um, uh, football, which I dropped <laughs> later on. And uh uh, hockey and baseball. In fact, I went on to play hockey at the university level and at a oh, school wow. which is now uh, which is now a Division One school and rated number one in the country as we as we speak. So I grew up in an athletic family, but uh, my my mother um, uh, uh, was involved. In fact, I like to tell people that uh, I got involved in music because of a woman and drugs and. Uh, and the woman is my mother, and she drugged me into it. So I started playing clarinet, and beca and only because we had a a uh, a metal clarinet, one of those silver tone clarinets. Um, in fact, it, in my office in in uh, Minnesota, I have it and made it into a lamp. In fact, fact, it sounds better as a lamp than it does <laughs> as a as a clarinet. But nevertheless. That was my start. I was doing well. I was really doing uh, well and um, uh, got up to 10th grade. As I mentioned, I played uh, football. And uh, these were the days prior to having face masks. And I, uh, I, uh, I, a football player came in and caught me face high with his helmet, and I lost my front teeth. Oof. And um, I went, uh, I went uh, two and a half years without any front teeth. That was about October of 10th grade. I didn't come in, didn't get, I get the false teeth in until probably, oh, I don't know, maybe uh, let's call it spring break uh, time of my senior year. So you'll have to trust me. I was a real charmer uh, going around with no, uh, no front teeth, but that did 
all kinds of things, none of which are good for my clarinet playing. So my band director, bless his heart, and I loved him to pieces. He said, well, let's try bass clarinet, of which, um, and you know, obviously the fingerings are the same, and I could hold it with the teeth um, just on each side of where the, the gaping hole was. And uh, so I played bass clarinet. We were starting a little jazz ensemble in school, and uh, they had only one tenor saxophone player, so they asked if I'd play the bass clarinet playing the second tenor parts, and which is an interesting situation. I'll use the word interesting, and because you could obviously read the same parts. And so then I started playing um, uh, saxophone. When I went to college, my major instrument was uh, alto saxophone, but I was playing a fair bit uh, professionally, and some of it was in in pit orchestras where they would say, you know, you had to read one book, which is sort of flute, clarinet, and first alto sax, and so I I uh, worked on alto sax, and and um, so I became a woodwind player, and that's and played a, a you know fair bit uh, professionally at that level. But then, um, <laughs> come to find out, I probably should have been a brass player because I set up pretty naturally for brass. And so I have uh, I feel comfortable playing uh, most of the instruments. And uh, so that's my sort of my musical background. I did a uh, bachelor's degree at St. Cloud State University, a master's degree at the University of Northern Colorado, which is just a great music school. And then also to uh, a doctorate uh, at St. Cloud as well. The hockey story really stands out to me. Yep. And so you played college yep. hockey at St. Cloud State, which as you, I just looked it up, you are correct, number one in the country right now. What I'm curious about is how that athletic experience translated to you as a teacher in the classroom, as a band teacher. Well, I think, it, I think, the, I think there's a lot of similarities between athletics and music. And first of all, if you're going to be good at anything, you've got to, you've got to work at it. And I think that that goes back and forth. Music um, taught me that I, if I wanted to be really good, I had to deal with details with, and um, athletics taught me that I have to put a lot of energy in um, into it. Now I must uh, say that I only played a year of uh, college hockey, uh, frankly, because at that point in time, I decided that I had limited um, <laughs> opportunities as a professional hockey player. And besides that, the university where I was playing uh, was recruiting kids who were bigger, faster, and stronger than me. And, um, and then, but I was taking music classes and continuing to play in the pit orchestras and all of that sort of thing. And so I really, I, I'm, I'm grateful that I've had the opportunity to, to do both at, you know, a, a relatively high level. And I think that they, in many respects, go hand in glove, as long as you don't get into saying one is better than the other and all of that sort of thing. Cause I think it's, uh, it's had an important role in making me who I am today. When I took my first high school job, it was, a, it was at a Catholic school where athletics were very important at an all boys. School. Sure. I never wanted sure. to make, I never wanted to make those kids choose between me, the band director and their coach, because they would have chosen athletics every time. Well, and I think that's, and I think that's because so much of it has to do with today's culture is let's face it, uh, an athletic uh, culture. And I, and sadly, um, you don't have any problem getting people to going to ball games, but again, sadly, you have lots of problems, people going to high level concerts. And I think that one of the things that predicates that is that, um, athletics it focuses on the unexpected. Uh, in other words, the surprise, the surprise element, whereas music predicates and is focused on on, in fact, the, the expected. And so that it isn't the same kind of surprise that, that, uh, sort of is part of, uh, who both are, what both athletics and music are. So Bruce, um, how about teachers when you were young? Do you, do you have any teachers that stand out from your, from your youth? Well, I do. And uh, I'll start with my, uh, he became a high school band director, but he was also the, uh, the person who started me. And uh, he, uh, his name was um, 
Robert Shannon, and I grew up in I grew up in uh, a suburb of Minneapolis. And I just remember, um, actually, I started in sixth grade, and uh, which was customary in that school. And he would come in, drive in. I remember he had a big Oldsmobile, which was the trunk was as big as a house, all full of instruments. And we'd run out and grab an instrument. And uh, you know, I remember grabbing a clarinet and. And uh, we could never take him home because they, he was going from school to school. And, and um, but then I told my mom what I did. And that's when she said, well, I've got one someplace. Let's find it and, so to speak, polish it up and get you started on clarinet. So then he became um, a, an outstanding uh, high school band director. And one of the things that I uh, appreciate him for, although he was sort of in the tyrant years of band conducting because our history goes back and we can all know of a few people who had a reputation as being a bit of a tyrant and he, and, and he was, but we always knew that he was, um, had our welfare, uh, our personal welfare first and foremost, but he also played great music. And, you know, I remember playing, for example, um, uh, the, uh, last movement of the Shostakovich five. I remember playing, the um, Elsa's procession of the cathedral. I remember uh, playing uh, the Ruslan and Ludmila orchestra a piece um, or overture, I should say. And because in those days there was not a lot of band music being written, most of what the bands were playing, frankly, were transcriptions. And it wasn't really until I started teaching, um, you know, and I started teaching in 1963 and uh, that's when uh, composers were starting to write for concert band and so i remember him well but i also remember him robert shannon uh, when i mentioned i had my uh, two front teeth broken and and uh, we were, i was out of commission on clarinet saying to me hey bruce why don't you uh, why don't you come in and let's talk a little bit about theory and that's when I first started writing a little bit for um, oh, some of the kids in the band, and that's where I quickly learned that clarinets and flutes can't play the same music. And, um, and so he got me started writing. And then I remember he said, you know, he said, I'm going to be gone uh, tomorrow. Um, he said that there will be a sub coming in, but not a music sub. Uh, would you mind directing uh, the rehearsal? And, of course, I thought that was just really outstanding. Well, he came back a little early. Um, he was, came back maybe the last 10 or 15 minutes of the class period. And sure enough, there he was uh, uh, watching me conduct. And, and he just kind of put his arm around me and thanked me. So I'm, I'm very grateful to him. Now, going forward, um, on, my, on my master's degree, uh, there's so many people out uh, at the University of well, it's now called uh, Northern Colorado, University of Northern Colorado. At the time, it was called, um, yeah, it'll get it. I'll get it. Well, anyway, um, it was, uh, but I remember having Buddy Baker, uh, the great trombone player, as my jazz ensemble director. In fact, he had a septet, and he asked me to play in it. Uh, I remember Wayman Walker, my private uh my private woodwind teacher was Lauren Bartlett. So I had just a, just great, great experiences uh, at all those places. Yeah. Northern Colorado has always been a great jazz school, at least as long as I can remember. Yeah. And their, and their, their band, I mean, their concert band is outstanding. In fact, they've asked me to come out and, and uh, uh, direct uh, for the band reunion in July and uh, which is going to be the retirement of two of the main stays there, uh, Ken Singleton and D and Dick Main. Yeah, I have a couple pieces published with Grand Mesa Music, and and they conducted those on their recordings. Yeah, they're they're outstanding people. So I think it was. I just looked it up, Bruce. It was the Colorado State College of Education. That's right. Yep. Yeah, Colorado State College. Thank you for doing that. Oh, sure. I've been I've been really I've been really close to them for a long time, and uh, I've just kind of come to think of it as UNC University of Northern Colorado. 
So, uh, Bruce, can you tell me about your first, sort of the transition from college and university to teaching your first job? What was that like? My first, my very first job was I was a senior at um, St. Cloud State University. My wife um, and I were married. Uh, we've been married uh, this summer. We will have been married uh, 56 years. And uh, so we uh, were married just before our senior year of college, needed to have a job. And uh, a local music store said, you know, they're starting up a band program out in this town of St. Joseph, which is just outside of St. Cloud, looking for a band director, would you be interested? And so I went out there and, you know, did the recruiting thing, had um, 80 kids in, in that beginning band, and I just have wonderful memories of that. Um, it was a part-time job, so I needed to have a full-time job, so I was there just a year, and then when I graduated and received my teaching degree and license, I taught in a little town in northern Minnesota, and it was, uh, I was the entire music department. So I did uh, the band and the choir and the classroom music and all of those things. And I, I, it was great because I loved the faculty meetings because I could just sit down with a cup of coffee and talk to myself. And uh, so that was my first teaching experience. Then I went to, um, and the town in which uh, I live most of the year, um, I live eight months of the year in uh, Minnesota, uh, four months in Arizona. And you can probably guess which four months I live in Arizona. And, um, and we, um, <clears throat> so I taught in Elk River and I think I taught there. I can't remember. It was either 20, I think it was 22 years. And I was a high school band director, but after, after about, uh, 10 years of doing that, and this is important because, um, I, um, I think I, I, if I were to characterize myself as a teacher in those years, I was a, a frustrated conductor. And so after 10 years, uh, I applied to, to uh, medical school and I wanted to become a physician so I could have an easier schedule. And, um, and the University of Minnesota Medical School convinced me to go back to teaching and uh, I think uh, it was a good thing because I had about eh, five, uh, four or five reasons, uh, maybe five reasons to go back to teaching. That's the wife, three kids, and a house payment. And um, so I, I went back, but that's where I um, went back to the same school district and became uh, the elementary band director and music supervisor and, um, and stayed there. And then massive budget cuts in 1982, and so I went back to uh, uh, teaching both high school band and uh, the elementary uh, and running the elementary program. It became a big program. We were starting maybe a couple of hundred kids a year, and I think doing well. When did you go back to? I mean, you went back to teaching after the the medical school experience. When did you go back yeah. to mm -hmm. graduate school to Northern Colorado? Where does that fit into this? Sure. Um, actually, I had I had uh, gone to to graduate school, um, and that was prior to my decision to try medical school. And and I I know where I was going with this is that um, for the first time, as I went back to teach elementary band, which I hadn't done before, I think I learned how to become a teacher. And for me, it was the greatest. Um, experience in the world because every day I was motivated and inspired by the kids and hopefully they were inspired uh, by me and um, one of the things that I talk about a lot now as I go out into clinics is it's it's absolutely critical that we develop a culture of excellence at whatever level we're at I know people talk about you know dropouts and all of those kinds of things those things don't exist um, to any degree in where you have a culture of excellence. So people say, well, how did you transition? You got a dual job where you're doing high school and you were also doing elementary. You know, I was uh, in the same day. How did you transition? Well, I think what happens is that you, you, uh, you don't, your expectations don't change 
but the standard changes. For example, if you're teaching in high school, you're always thinking about sound. You're always thinking about tone. Um, and uh, you're doing the same thing in the elementary school, thinking about sound and tone and all of those kinds of things. It's just that you have to understand and realize uh, what each level is capable of doing. And so I, I loved my time in elementary. In fact, I probably would have stayed there um, had it not been the fact that we had this budget cut and the superintendent asked me if I'd do the dual role of both um, um, high school and elementary band. Yeah, there's two things that really jump out at me in that. And, and boy, you really hit me in the heart there because I've been teaching a long time. I'm in my over 20 years of teaching, and this is my first year teaching elementary band. And I feel like this has made me a better teacher in more ways than I can have can enumerate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, going it's there's a humility to teaching nine year olds, 10 year olds, you know, yeah. that, that comes from that because they don't really care about anything but being better. And so you have yeah, to right. like focus on them. Exactly. The other thing you mentioned is a culture of excellence. And this is something that pops up a lot on this, this show because the people, the band directors who are most successful and the teachers who are most successful do have this, do foster this. And so for my listeners who might be out there, who might be young teachers, how, in what ways, or what advice would you give to foster that culture of excellence? Do you have any hows to that? I do. And it's pretty simple. And that is, is that you, uh, first of all, you select music and repertoire that the kids can make music on. I, and music with, I should say, I, you know, um, I don't do, I don't adjudicate festivals anymore. And the reason I, I don't, I find that I'm somewhat frustrated. And the reason I'm frustrated is, and disappointed, um, is the fact that so many, um, bands that I hear, uh, are playing music that they can't sound very good at. Kids know when they sound good and when they don't sound good. And if they don't sound good, they want out of there. And I would suggest that most, most uh, bands that I hear um, would, would do better if they selected music um, that's just a tad bit easier for them, but then learn how, learn how to make music. You know, when I was first started teaching, I, re, I you know, if I could conduct the piece correctly, then I felt as though I was ready to teach the piece. Nowadays, um, and I do a fair bit of, of guest conducting, I, I can't, I cannot, I don't feel comfortable unless I have studied the score enough where I can make music. Um, I think it's it's critical that we understand that Notes are like words and phrases are like sentences. And so that if we can't make a musical sentence, then the kids are going to be frustrated and disappointed. I think what happens so oftentimes is that directors um, tackle too much. And in many cases, they're, they like doing pieces that, you know, they like personally. And I can, I can appreciate that. But not always do they take pieces that, that where they can make music. And that speaks to one other thing, and that is some music is just really difficult to make music out of, whereas other pieces, other pieces, if they're well-written, well-crafted, kind of make music themselves. Yeah, it's, it's one of the hardest things that I've been dealing with coming back to the elementary school is figuring out you know, what the fourth graders can play after X number of lessons, what the fifth graders can play right. after a year and a couple of weeks. You know, these this has been a real real challenge for me. And I mentioned that my fifth graders are doing Starfire March. They really love it because they can make music out of it. Maybe, yes, yeah. Maybe and it's a little you. yeah. Maybe it's a little easy for them, but that's not what they're interested in. We can do method book stuff for harder stuff. They want to make they want to go to the concert and feel like they're playing well. Yep. And so do their parents. And, uh, it's, uh, you know, and, and now I'm kind of a, a second generation where, where some of my students, uh, children are, uh, uh, are in their bands, um, in, you know, in their elementary, middle school bands, and they're coming back and they're saying nice things about how, 
the pieces that I write uh, are they're able to sound good. Now, having said that, I hope I'm not breaking my arm, patting myself on the back. But what I'm what I meant by that is they is that they aren't always what I would call art music, but they are crafted so that the kids can sound good. So Bruce, I think, I think it'd be interesting for my listeners to talk about the genesis of writing method books, you know, going back to best in class and, and I'm curious about like how you approach that as an author of a method book and, and sort of what were your considerations in the early days? Sure. Um, I think uh, as I look at uh, the three method book series that I've done, I think that it it, uh, that it would be fair to say that uh, the reason they have been successful is that they address the special needs of each and every instrument within the context of a full band setting. Um, uh, The method book process uh, started with me. I was teaching. Uh, elementary um, um, band, and I had these, you know, tons of worksheets, and uh, and so finally, my principal and I were dear friends, and I remember him coming in and and saying, "Bruce, your office is a mess." I said, "Well, yeah, I'm a band director," and uh, he said, "Why don't you just buy put all that stuff together and make a book out of it, and at least your office will be clean," and um, so that's what I did. And so I went and I went to the local music store, spoke to the buyer, and I said, well, here's some ideas that I have. Do you think others would be interested? He said, well, let me shop it around. And so he gave it to some people, and some people were excited about it. And so then I wrote uh, to several publishing companies, and uh, Chose was the first one that expressed interest in it. And I've been with them uh, exclusively. Um, ever since. And that was in 1980. Best in Class came out in 1982. Uh, As you look at a method book, you have to decide what is, what is, as Ford said, job one. And that for me is the concept of tone, which means, in my opinion, that you need to start with long tones. And if you start in with shorter notes, that interrupts um, the concept of tone. And so you say, okay, well, Bruce, that sounds all well and good, but how do you develop a sense of rhythm? And it all comes down to what's called sound before symbol, where you have the kids feel the pulse as they are in the process of making music. When I first, when I, in fact, when I did a, uh, a doctoral degree, I was considering what effect a Suzuki might have on the band world. And I, after a certain period of time, I came to realize that that, uh, it just didn't, uh, it wasn't gonna work because Suzuki basically taught, uh, and it's heavy, and this is not a criticism of Suzuki, but heavy parental involvement. And the kids learn to make music and make wonderful music early on. Now, where they hit, where they stumble, is when they have to go from playing everything by ear to then having to learn how to read. So the process of what I what I do is is I say, okay, um, here is he, uh, let's start in and we learn the, uh, we learn some notes. But then when we present a rhythmic concept, it uh, sound before symbol always comes in f- from the three step process of hear, see, and apply. And so they they hear it first of all. So now that looks like rote. And then you say, here's what it looks like on paper. Now here's where it departs from rote learning is you say, here's another activity that uh, another song that has exactly the same rhythm as the previous one. And without giving any further instruction, you tell them to apply what they learned on the previous exercise to this new exercise. And um, so in other words, they're learning, they're hearing, and they're learning and to feel the pulse uh, right from a previous exercise and then applying it to the new one. I pretty much in the beginning divorced rhythm completely from sound. 
and I worked sure. on them as separate concepts. You know, it's interesting because as you correctly observed, I mean, I, again, you know better than I do. I'm, I'm deferring to you, but it seems to me that, you know, starting with whole notes is tough on rhythm, but starting with quarter notes is tough on tone. Sure. Sure. And so let's, let's take, let's take, um, uh, the whole note concept. And this comes back. This is, I mean, what I'm, I tend to be a student of learning theories, but then translate them into practical day by day lessons. And so let's take the concept of a whole note. So you say, okay, how do we develop a sense of rhythm in a whole note? And so what we what it's important that we do, and it's and it doesn't have to do with foot tapping. Uh, foot tapping, if you look at the research, will tell you um, uh, it certainly won't hurt. Um, but it what it it has uh, limited value. So this goes back to um, to the teachings of of a century or more ago, uh, Emile Jacques Delcroze, who said kids must feel the pulse and be able to sing the activity before they attempt to play it. So you take a whole note. So, okay, let's start on, on, uh, on, uh, me, uh, and me, two, three. And at the same time, you're going with your hands, press, 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 press off, two, three, press, press, press. And then you go to the, the next note and you say, okay, that's, uh, that's cool. Um, and so what's the next note going to sound like? Oh, that, let's call that um, fa, and let's have you sing it and use your hand motions. Press, 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 press off, singing the fa, and you haven't given them any instruction because they've already learned the previous concept. You just gave them the starting note. And so when you introduce a quarter note, you introduce it on uh, a static pitch, and then the next two or three exercises should have exactly the same rhythm. And then you apply it as you select correlated music to, um, to reinforce that concept. Yeah. Yeah. I love the fact that you use solfege too. It, it, you know, cause it works with every instrument. You don't have to worry about note names yes. and transposition. That's exactly right. I guess the last question I want to ask you, we've been going for a little while. It's sort of flown by. The, the last question about the method books is over the years, what's the question that you've been most asked about them? Oh, wow. Um, let's see what, uh, well, I mean, there's the obvious general one and that is why did you do this? <laughs> and, sure. uh, and I'm always delighted to hear that because Frankly, if I can't give an answer to that, I shouldn't have put it in. But it has to. It comes down to the fact that I think that, you know, as um, as we said early on, in that we all stand on the shoulders of the people who came before us. And I tend to be a a lifelong learner. I study. I write. All of these things. And what I've come to uh, realize is that um, many of today's particularly young music educators haven't had the opportunities uh, to really delve into these things. And so consequently, it becomes a joy for me to say to them, uh, let's sit down. Let's talk about why this is important. Have you considered this? And and so it, it comes down. It's a general comment. Um, and, you know, uh, little do they realize and little did I realize when I first started writing method books that you're um, restricted to to the number of pages being six uh, multiples of 16. Then you're restricted. And this is I've self-imposed this on myself. No more than eight lines of music per page, because otherwise pages tend to look cluttered. And also, too, I uh, little do they realize you can you're restricted to having only 30 note heads per line. So when people say, well, for example, why didn't you do well, how come the songs are only eight measures long? And uh, for the, at the start, and I'll say, well, I'd love to be able to do additional uh, to stretch it out a little bit, maybe play, you know, the, the B theme of that particular song. But I've got to get moving teaching concepts, and if I do the B theme, I'm going to run out of pages. And um, so consequently, uh, not knowing the limitations of the publishing and printing world, 
um, you um, have to take into a, uh, a lot of those considerations. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, one of the books right now. I'm looking at a mallet book from the Standard of Excellence. Uh-huh. And yeah, I'm noticing all that, um, all those things. One thing you mentioned, why multiples of 16? It has to do with the printing press process. Um, in fact, I just proposed I just proposed a, uh, um, a, a, a book to the publisher um, who's just been, I mean, basically they publish everything I do. And I propose that, that for some instruments, it'd be a 24 page book. And they said, Bruce, can you stretch it out to be a uh, 32? Cause it's way cheaper for us to produce a 32 page book than it is a 24 page book, which sounds uh, crazy, but that's, it has to do with, it's a trip. Um, 16 pages is one trip through the printing press. Oh, of course, because it's four pages front and back. Yes, uh huh. Okay, I see. And then, oh. and the way, and the way things come out of a printing press, folded, and all of that sort of thing. Is there anything in the book that you would change? I mean, maybe that's not a fair question. I don't have to ask that. Oh, well, yes, you do. I think that's important uh, to ask. And and you know, as as one does, once something puts you put it into a book, then. Uh, by and large, it can't be uh, changed. Um, in, for example, in Standard of Excellence, um, I wrote, uh, I used a little tune uh, when the book first came out, and that was "Kookaburra sits on the old gum tree." But I got my I got my hand slapped because that's still under copyright, if you can imagine that, and it's it's free of copyright restrictions in the United States, but uh, you have to look at other things. So early books came out with uh, Kookaburra uh, in it, and the later editions, I had uh, replaced that with hand slap, uh, let's see, foot stomp, hand slappers, foot stompers, and hand, cla- hand clappers, foot stompers, and knee slappers, a little a rhythmic exercise. And so you do have to uh, be concerned with that. I learned my lesson on that, and Therefore, in tradition of excellence, uh, we didn't have any of those problems. But I learned something that's very important. Uh, my supervising teacher, when I was student teaching, is a name that many of you, uh, you certainly, Mark, and many of your listeners would know, and that's John Zedeklik, who wrote Corral and Shaker Dance. And I remember asking him when I first published something, and I asked him, I said, uh, John, let me ask you a question, and that is, um, you wrote Corral and Shaker Dance, enormously successful, one of the great uh, classics of the band literature. Would you change anything? And he said, oh, of course I would, but it was the best I could do at the moment. And I think, and I think that that's, uh, that's uh, good advice for anybody, and that is that you do the best you can for the moment, and because many things can't be changed, I mean, whether it be writing or things in life, that uh, you do the best you can, but you, you screw up sometimes. And when you screw up, you can't dwell on that. And as I like to tell my students, that's why the windshield is much bigger than the rearview mirror. The band world is really small. Yes, it and is. So you just mentioned that your supervising teacher was John Zedeklik. Most of the successful people I know in the band community have associated themselves with other successful people in the band community. Well, you know, as you mentioned early on, it's a very, very, very small uh, community in which we live. And, you know, it, it becomes it's really strange when you stop and think that um, there, there's sort of mutual uh, respect um, uh, when people do things well. And I'm going to now uh, focus strictly on the, the writing business. And, uh, and, you know, if I were simply a high school band director, and I don't mean that in a disparaging way, I would have, I would have a difficult time calling up uh, Jim Kernel, for example, or any of the other you know, uh, respected, uh, or Robert W. Smith or Jim Swearing, and but we've become friends because we we hang out um, at uh, various conferences, and therein lies another suggestion that I would have for our listeners, and that is is that um, going to conferences 
is just, uh, it's, I mean, there, you can't put a price on that um, because you get to meet people. And frankly, as a composer, I am thrilled when a, um, someone calls me and says, Bruce, what would you do in this, or uh, in this particular case, or what did, why did you write this? And that measure seems a little wacky. Why'd you do that? And, uh, I'm thrilled, you know, we're, um, uh, the people who are writing regularly, uh, most of them, most of us are still living. And, uh, so therefore we enjoy, um, very much getting, hearing, uh, comments. And, and by the way, if people ever want to contact me, um, they can always go, first of all, to my website, which is brucepearsonmusic.com. And there you'll get a chance to see and hear all of uh, my pieces. Or if you want to write me a personal note, uh, it's uh, brucepearsonmusic at gmail.com. And uh, I would love to talk to them. Sometimes I get, you know, people wanting to do commissions. We can talk through that with them. And uh, it, it's just because I think it's so important to realize that We've all, we're all in this together. Some of us have transitioned from the daily um, opportunity to teach kids to uh, writing and some people whom I uh, respect uh, immensely are those that are day in, day out, uh, helping kids uh, to enjoy the music making process. Yeah, yeah, I, I think your comments about meeting other people. That's one of the great joys of this podcast is that I've had an opportunity to talk to you and to Robert Sheldon and to Charlie Mangini and to Jerry Junkin and to John Mackey and whoever it is. And, and it's, sure. it's developing relationships that are meaningful and matter and have helped me as a teacher and as a musician. Absolutely. Without question. Yep. yep. All right, Bruce, we should do these final questions. Okay. So I, I really appreciate your time. This this flew by. That's been fifty minutes, and it feels like fifteen. There's there's well, so much I could great. ask I, you. <laughs> I've, re I've really enjoyed it, Mark. Oh, Thanks for the opportunity. Oh sure, sure. Thank you. All right, Bruce. So these are the questions I ask all of my guests, and mm -hmm. the, the first one is: Where do you draw the line between healthy and unhealthy competition in music? Well, uh, that's an easy one for me because I don't think music should be competitive. Um, I think that um, sometimes, and I can only relate this to uh, the fact that when I was a high school band director and heavily involved in competition, I became a poorer teacher and I was focused on a rating rather than on making music. So that's an easy one for me. I don't know if music should be competitive. All right, Bruce, this is a question that a lot of young teachers especially struggle with. How do you achieve a work-life balance as a music teacher? Tough, tough. And that's something I'm still learning. But one of the things I've learned is that, um, I, and I write every day, um, I do manage to uh, carve out an afternoon uh, to play uh, a round of golf. But however, um, I, I limit myself to saying, okay, at five o'clock, and of course, I don't start as early as a lot of teachers, but at five o'clock, my office shuts down. And so I, I've had to become very disciplined um, because um, it, if I weren't, I'm afraid that um, I wouldn't have the family that I'm blessed with now. It's, it's, it's a discipline. You say, what's important in life? And then are all the activities leading to that proportionately? And so um, I think that uh, each of us have to determine what's most important. I can't tell anybody, but I can say for myself, this is what I need to do. All right, Bruce. So this question is um, pretty nebulous and pretty speculative, but what are the challenges mm -hmm. facing music education and how can we best meet them? I think uh, I alluded to it earlier, and that is a couple of things. And one of them has to do with the fact that uh, teachers are, are um, oftentimes playing music too difficult. And I think it's important that they select repertoire that those kids can only experience in that band room. Um, and I'm not opposed to, I'm not opposed to uh, 
occasionally playing pop music, providing it's written well. But sadly, many uh, schools, that becomes their diet. And, and I think that that's one of the, the great challenges that we have uh, today. The other thing is, is that I think uh, teachers um, oftentimes are frustrated with a kid's lack of, of uh, success and it's rarely the kid's fault. It really has to do with the teachers tackling too much or too difficult, not knowing how to teach that, and then as a result, getting frustrated and angry with the kids. Yeah, it's, that's a, it's, it's a tough thing, especially when you're young. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I mean, I've, I've been in that situation. I can think back to situations where that was, that was me as a teacher. Oh, yes, and, and me as well. In fact, I was going to say, I'd like to go back to uh, the students that I had for the first several years of teaching and apologize to them. <laughs> yep. Yeah, everything that happens in our classrooms, it, that's us. Yes. All right. So, Bruce, this sort of is related to a couple things we've already talked about. But if you could mm -hmm. travel back in time and, and see your high school graduation, what advice would you give your 18-year-old self? Well, first of all, I wouldn't take myself so seriously. Second of all, I would, I would, uh, um, I was, I, uh, I was not very disciplined, and uh, I wish that I had had a a mentor in those early years and saying, taking me under their wing and saying, Bruce, let's let's do a lot of things differently, but let me help you do it. And so, consequently, that would be that would be uh, what I'd like to see from my younger self. Is there anything that you can suggest that we can do as maybe older, more experienced teachers to help mentor younger teachers? Well, I think one of the challenges, I think, in, in that process is that, and I was in the same boat. I mean, I thought I knew everything. I didn't need a mentor. And yet, um, there's, uh, I think that if we can graciously um, uh, come alongside and not in a in a condemning way or a judgmental way, but come to them uh, basically and, and said, you know, here's what I'd like, or here's, here's a piece of music. Let's study it together. I remember one of the great opportunities that I had and sadly I didn't take as much advantage of it is early on, uh, Harry Beejan and I were, were both conducting a festival and he said to me, Bruce, he said, uh, how about if you come up to uh, my home this summer, uh, and uh, we'll study scores together. And yeah, what a what a wonderful opportunity. And and uh, like I say, I wish I had taken uh, taken that uh, opportunity to heart and done it more. Bruce, if you could choose, what would be the final work that you'd conduct or hear or interact with? Great question. And you know, uh, as you sort of go through the library of your mind, <laughs> uh, what pieces, and, and um, this may come as a surprise because it's not a band piece, um, but I'd love, love, love to conduct uh, the last movement of the Beethoven nine with full orchestra and uh, full choir. Oh, I think, I don't think I could make it through it. I think I'd be crying. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you get into the act of conducting, you know, you know, being the conductor, but boy, it's hard. It's, it's, it's such a tremendous piece of music. It's so emotional for me, that piece. Yeah. And me, and me. All right. Is there anything coming up that you'd like to share or promote? Oh, you see, I'm not a salesperson. I'm just a, a, a teacher who's been given the opportunity to, to write and, and I write every day and, uh, um, you know, uh, I, we've just, my colleague Ryan Nolan and I have just finished uh, the Excellence in Chamber Music series, books one, two, and three. And now we're writing on another project, and I'm hesitant to tell you <laughs> what, the, what it is, only, only because my experience has told me that as soon as you mention something, they immediately call their local music store and say, I listened to Bruce and he said he was working on this and I want to order it. And, and we aren't far enough along for to even put a, a, a date on it. Um, but um, we are now in the recording process of every year we come out with about 10 or 12 uh, pieces that are correlated 
It's called the Excellence in Performance. And um, and we're uh, going to be recording them next next Monday. And uh, they some of your listeners may want to look for those pieces. They're basically grade one to three. And uh, so that's kind of what we're where we're doing. And there's sort of a uh, a rhythm to how we produce things. And this is the time of year where things have been, uh, you know, through the editorial process and now are in the hands of the musicians to record them. Yeah, Bruce. So I already, you already mentioned how people can get in touch with you. So what I'm going to ask before we wrap it up, is there anything that you'd like to offer before we, we, we finish? Well, um, and we kind of touched on a little bit. I, I'm willing uh, and would encourage anybody who, who um, any of your listeners to, uh, if they want to get a, in a hold of me and to talk through things, and I'll certainly do what I can because certainly there's lots of people that have helped me, and if I can, uh, you know, uh, pay back uh, to those who are now where I was uh, some time ago, I'm certainly wanting to do that. Yeah, isn't that what the spirit of what we do is? Mm-hmm. All right, Bruce, thank you so much for the conversation. I really appreciate it. Well, Mark, I thank you for the opportunity, and I think you're doing a tremendous service, and, and I look forward to when we can do it again. 